Hi everyone, this is Neil Reitertair, also known as the Wax Whisperer. Thank you for joining me in my latest video. We have here a patient, as you can see, who attended with bilateral, fully occluding earwax, and we're going to commence with this there left ear first. As you may have noticed, their wax is quite soft, and that's because they've been using um, some olive oil spray, medical grade olive oil spray, prior to attending. Um, they historically have their ears irrigated um, at their local doctor's surgery, so they're used to um, putting some olive oil drops prior to having their ears irrigated. So one of the prerequisites, um, it's recommended when you have your ears irrigated that you have the wax softened. It just facilitates the flushing out of the wax. Um, with microsuction, um, it's no real necessary requirement. Some companies uh, may advise though to use some drops a few days before, which is totally fine. Uh, in fact, when we train our clear wax specialists, uh, I also advise if they're completely, um, it's a, if it's a new skill that they're acquiring, um, to definitely ask their patients to use some olive oil spray in a, in, 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 um, prior to attending because it just it can help. The problem is if you is if you over use the drops and it makes the wax really um, too wet and too loose and harder to remove. So what I'm doing here, you can see this patient's got this sheet of dead skin and it was actually clarinetting with the full zone of suction pro and it, it was difficult to reach the wax plug without making contact with this dead skin sheet that I've just removed so I reverted back to the fine end there to help try and remove that sheet of dead skin and as I did it brought forwards this wax plug so um, but yeah, I was, the reason why I switched instrument was because of the clarinetting. So clarinetting is when you're suctioning dead skin in particular, the skin can violently flap at the tip of the suction probe and that emits a very loud, high frequency squeal. It's not only loud for the patient, it's loud for myself. So you wanna try and avoid that. And this wax has been there for a while, you can tell by the color, it's quite dark. So now that's the patient's eardrum and can, there's a bit of vascularis of the hammer bone. You can see the blood vessels and capillaries. Um, and I've just hammered two of the three bones in the ear. You've got the hammer bone, also known as the malleus, and that's the handle of the malleus. And then you've got part of the anvil, uh, which is medically known as the, the incus, and it's the, 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 the long process. So with the, um, the hammer bone, you've got uh, various different elements and components of the hammer bone. So you've got the umbo, which is the section of the hammer bone that attaches itself to the center of the eardrum. We call that the umbo. The main handle, the main stalk, we call that the manubrum. And then you may notice at the top of the, the, the main handle of the hammer bone, you have this spherical um, section of the bone. And we call that either the lateral short process. Then you have the neck of the, uh, the malleus, which sometimes is not visible. Um, if it is visible, then it's typically if the eardrum is retracted or if there's what we call an autoatic otomy forming where the scutum, which is the bone at the roof of the, the, the ear canal near to the eardrum is beginning to erode. And so you then can start visualizing within the, the middle ear. And after the neck of the malleus, you've got the, the head of the malleus. And then the head of the malleus is connected to the body of the inca. So that's the also known as the anvil. Then you've got a short process of the, the anvil, which you don't normally see. And then you've got the the long process. Now, the long process of the anvil, you can typically see uh, in younger patients where the eardrum is still translucent. Um, but as we get older, the eardrum loses its translucency and it becomes more opaque, so it's more and more difficult to see. And also, if the eardrum is retracted, if it's sucked inwards, you can sometimes see the long process of the incus. Um, then the point at which the incus connects to the stapes, which is also known as the, the stirrup, is called the incostapedial joint. And then with the stapes, you've got an anterior and posterior cruise, which then uh, merge with the stapes foot plate. And the stapes foot, foot plate is what is connected to the oval window. And the oval window is the gateway, the entrance, if you like, to the cochlea, the human organ of hearing. So that's the, you've got three bones that work in synchrony um, and they help to transmit sound waves from the eardrum to the cochlea. So again, I've just labeled that. Um, there's less vascularis here. So uh, with the left side, the wax is more impacted on the eardrum. So that's one of the reasons. I did perform a pressure test and uh, both middle ears were functioning fine. There's no retraction there. But on that side, they didn't. it would appear that they had a bit of an attic retraction. The top part of the eardrum was slightly sucked in, but 
it was fine when I did the pressure test. Just mopping up near the entrance. The, yet patient's a younger patient, um, hence why they've got that translucency of the eardrum. And again, I'm just using the fine end. And that's all the wax. You can see how dark it is. You can see that sheet of dead skin about nine o'clock on the screen. So that was the section in the left ear that I had to remove before going back to get extract the wax because it was just making too much noise, too much clarinetting. And guys, um, I promised yesterday that I'm going to share with you some of the emails that I know have been sent into Bishar by your very kind selves. I can't thank you enough. It's it's very humbling and to know that you guys are all supporting the cause. And the cause is to, it's, it's for patient benefit. Um, it's to avoid as I know a lot of pa uh, patients now uh, and members of the public are concerned because they are uh, attending certain institutions and companies in good faith, thinking the person who's treating them is appropriately uh, clinically qualified to perform earwax. They have all the prerequisite knowledge and training and skill and practical hands-on experience inside the ear, when clearly that's not the case. So I have now openly invited all the major high street hearing chains to publicly disclose who's actually being trained to perform earwax removal. Um, I've also advised the, the senior management of the high street hearing chains that surely if they were going to have their tooth extracted or filling performed at the dentist's, um, they obviously would be expecting that the dentist is going to be carrying out the procedure, not um, a general member of staff like the receptionist. And in that same vein, um, I've asked them to pass on um, and extend that courtesy of uh, informing their own customers um, who are actually performing the procedure. And then it's up to the patient. If, if the patients are happy with someone who's not clinically qualified um, to perform earwax removal, and there is, that, that's, that's, that's an informed decision. It's not illegal. I must stress that in the UK because earwax removal, similarly to Botox injections and fillers, it's not a regulated activity. And that's the next battle. Now, also, I know a lot of you, um, people who have sent this uh, your emails in, have actually had a reply back from Bisha. Um, I'm going to comment on that tomorrow. So I'm not really happy with the com uh, the comment, the reply back from Bisha, because they are suggesting that um, up until now there's been no real discussion, and all the emails that they're receiving is sparking conversation. That's complete um, fallacy, because uh, as you all know, I've been trying to raise this topic for the last few weeks. Even prior to that. I have approached um, Bishar. We had a, a survey that we completed back in June and where I, I mentioned some of the, the malpractices that I feel should be addressed and I didn't get any reply. And they're not talking to us, the members. Uh, they're not talking to us, believe you me. They're talking to the public, which is great, which is, I, I appreciate that. But they're not speaking to members like myself and we wouldn't have even got to this stage. And that's because they still want to continue with this, guys. I know the email says that they may change tack. Uh, I, I really struggle. I can't see them doing a U-turn now. They've gone too far. And, and even the, the mere suggestion of what they're doing just shows a lack of common sense, really, and courtesy and care to the general public. It really, really does. Um, anyway, guys, uh, I appreciate all your support on this. We are making good headway. Um, so, and it's all down to you guys. Um, you're really sparing me on and supporting me, so I appreciate it. Thank you. Bye.